Um, as most of you know, the Wharton Customer Analytics Initiative is really dedicated to um, promoting academic research that has practical value. Uh, and so we've been working over a year now uh, to bring this conference together, which really kind of we think highlights um, how practically valuable academic research can be. Um, over a year ago, we had this idea uh, that you know maybe advertising effectiveness was a problem that academics weren't looking closely enough at. Uh, uh, some academics think of this as an old problem, a solved problem, but when we went out and talked to companies, lots of companies were doing lots of innovative and creative things when it comes to measuring advertising effectiveness. Um, so we had this idea that we were going to um, host a conference uh, and, and some research grants that would really catalyze academic research in this area, academic research of practical value. Um, of course, uh, once we decided that we were going to uh, look at advertising as this year's theme, we, we had to call up our colleagues, Catherine Hayes and, and Jerry Wind at the Wharton Future of Advertising Project, and a great collaboration was started. Uh, we put out a call for proposals over a year ago um, and asked academics to tell us what creative things they were doing in this space. We got over, over it was almost 40 proposals, 39 proposals. Uh, Jerry, Pete, uh, Eric, and I had to weed through these proposals and pick uh, 10 winners, nine of which you will hear about their research projects that they've been working on for over a year now. Um, so we're just excited to have this, this day here today. I'm gonna hand it over to Catherine, who's gonna talk a little bit about the logistics for the conference. Catherine? Adding my welcome for today. Um, I'm your social maven for today, actually, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about how to get to know each other. Um, what we thought we would do, uh, and if you haven't done it already, we've um, used the Bizabo app to get you all talking to each other. In addition to the great content that you're gonna be hearing up here, we <coughs> want you to learn from each other as well. So if you haven't done so already, you can go to bizabo.com, B-I-Z-Z-A-B-O, um, and download the app for your iPhone or your Android device and you'll be able to log in with LinkedIn and know who else is here, send messages and connect and um, meet each other during the breaks, there's the agenda, et cetera. So I encourage you to do that. We sent out an email on Monday from the Wharton Future of Advertising program, so take a look for that too. Um, in terms of social, what we're gonna be doing a little bit differently on the agenda is during the Q&A period, we're gonna stop the program for a second and have you at your tables talk for about five minutes about what you heard, what some of your questions are, and then we'll turn it back over to the moderators to have them um, call out to you to engage you with the panelists. So that's it. I'd like to turn it over to Jerry Wynn to tell you a little bit more about uh, what we're thinking in the future. Thank you. So, <clears throat> welcome. It's a delight to have all of you here and what uh, Primarily, would like to kind of uh, emphasize this again, the objective of what we're trying to do here, which is not only to hear the nine presentations, but to engage in active discussion uh, and ideally be able to take away from here ideas that we can later on continue to implement. And I would love you to be able to share with us uh, kind of your ideas, um, concerning how you implement some of the ideas that uh, we have here. We have a program as part of the future of advertising. We collaborate also with the ARF on uh, identifying the gaps in advertising measurement, or primarily advertising effectiveness measurement. And we've had few sessions uh, with uh, the, some of the key researchers in the field, and it's amazing the number of gaps uh, that were identified. Uh, so would love you all to participate in a survey that we're planning on identifying the gaps. Would love to hear your ideas, what are the key gaps in this area, and help us prioritize those areas so we'll be able to kind of move forward with this area. And Catherine will talk a little more about this today at lunch in terms of the, the survey that we're planning in this area. Uh, so again, welcome uh, to the, pro the program. Uh, would love your act active involvement and engagement here, and the reason you're kind of in tables, so to encourage actually interaction among you, so it won't be just one or two people asking questions, but rather everyone here to engage in active discussion, and enjoy the day, and have fun. Uh, and let me introduce now Eric Bradlow, who is uh, a close colleague, uh, the current director of the doctoral programs at Wharton, former editor of uh, Marketing Science, and uh, 
the kind of the uh, head with Pete uh, Fader, who is somewhere here, of uh, the Pete in the back here, of uh, our partner in this initiative here. Eric. Thanks, Jerry. Um, if you actually look at the program, you'll see that my role was supposed to be introducing our Dean, Thomas Robertson, who may be running a few minutes late, which happens with deans at times. So I'll take off my WCI hat and I'll put on a Dean Lee hat here, our Vice Dean of the Doctoral Programs hat. Notice the branding, by the way, <laughs> by, by here for the Doctoral Program. Let me say what I think Tom should say if time were to come. <laughs> Here's what he, will, he should say. I think he'll, he would say the following. I think when you think about the Wharton School, you think about empiricism. I think that's one of the things for both my academic and colleagues here in practice. I think that's the way we like to think about ourselves. We're an empirically data-driven school. I think what you're going to hear about today is obviously there's going to be some theory about you know, the way advertising might affect people's behavior. But at the end of the day, if we don't have data, whether it's I see many of my Google friends out here in the audience, I see many of my friends here or former friends from Yahoo Labs and other places and companies that actually run real-time experiments. That's what WCAI is about. It's what the future of advertising is about. And I think it's what the Wharton School is about. And so our mission at WCAI, and I know with Jerry and Catherine with the future of advertising, is to let, I, now I see the dean to my right, so I'm going to wrap up what I think Tom should have said, and I'll actually <laughs> introduce Tom in just a second. But I'm going to say what I would have said. What I would have said is that today really represents an important part of the mission of the Wharton School, which is to bring academic value to practice. And um, you know, I spent a number of years working in industry, Ellie the same way, and so we have a great appreciation for the value that academic and uh, practical collaborations working together. As a matter of fact, when Pete and I started the center five years ago, the basic idea was is that we were looking around, and to be honest, the best research was being done in industry, not in academia. And that was both because the thought leadership access to data was more interesting in practice than it was in academia, and that was part of the value of our center. So welcome to all of you, and let me just take uh, a minute to introduce our dean, uh, Tom Robertson. He's uh, here. Oh, there, there he is. There, that, that looks like Tom. Actually, let me say something about having a dean, by the way. This isn't on the script. I, I, I don't really speak from a script. Let me say what's nice to all of you. If you can ever work at a business school where your dean is a professor of marketing and you happen to be a marketing professor, it's a really good thing. So let me say why. Um, when you go to your dean and say, you know, two of your three of your colleagues want to run a conference about the effectiveness of advertising, the dean doesn't go, hmm, I wonder why that might be interesting. I think Tom knows why that's interesting. When you go to your dean and say, you know what, two centers that we hope are a big part of the future of the school want to partner together, please support us, you don't have to convince your dean that this is something good to do. So we're very fortunate to have as our dean Tom Robertson. So let me just say a few words about Tom for those of you that don't know. Um, Tom is both our dean and the Reliance Professor of Management and Private Enterprise and obviously a professor of marketing here at Wharton. Um, for those of you who don't know, Tom recently announced that he's stepping down as dean in about a year from now, in June of 2004, ending, uh, 2014, ending his seven-year term. The good news is he's not going anywhere. He has promised me multiple times now that he's coming back to the marketing department, so he will be back on the seventh floor of Huntsman Hall where marketing professors belong. Um, Tom was actually a member of the standing faculty at Penn and at Wharton until 1994. He served many roles in between uh, leaving Wharton and coming back to Wharton, including the dean at the Gazetta School at Emory University. Uh, Tom also, during his time away from Penn, he was also deputy dean of the London Business School. And I think for anybody that's an academic or a person in practice in this audience knows that Tom personally has done a large amount of work in advertising, its impact on marketing strategy. And so um, please, let's take this moment to welcome our dean, Thomas Robertson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, you guys. <laughs> well, thank you, Rake. I don't know how much of that is true, but <laughs> it's nice of you to say those things. Uh, my main job is indeed to welcome you. You are an august uh, audience, and it's great to bring together uh, practitioners and uh, academics for a conference such as this. 
Um, we have a, two, a couple of initiatives uh, within marketing, within Wharton, that we're particularly proud of. We would call them jewels. One is the, the Future of Advertising Initiative, and the other is the uh, Customer Analy Analytics uh, Initiative. And so uh, as they come together on this very important topic around big data and involving uh, advertising effectiveness, I, I think it's really uh, ripe for potential contributions. I think obviously big data is where so much of the action is at the moment. Uh, most of the time we're trying to figure out, well, what is big data? But um, I, I think that uh, it's a, a very salient time and a time when potentially, uh, in, in terms of advertising, we could get greater focus on um, analytics-driven uh, decision-making um, and on empirical findings, um, something that hasn't always been the case uh, in terms of, uh, of the advertising uh, market. Um, big data is obviously a lot less structured. I mean, what we uh, struggle with uh, uh, in, in general and throughout the school is uh, how do you take all of the data you're bombarded with and either reduce it or find ways to uh, turn it into some form of understanding and some form of models uh, that will indeed be of value to us? And, and so we look at social media, we, we look at uh, sensors and web logs and, and mobile, uh, mobile applications, and we look at uh, attribution modeling, and I mean, we look at so many different uh, forms of data, and the whole challenge is how do we bring that all together and make sense out of it, and, and indeed use it to advantage. So it's, it's a, I think it's a brave new world, and it's one where there's the opportunity uh, to move in new directions and truly to make a contribution. Um, at, then I would say at Wharton, indeed, that's what we're committed to, uh, is being able to um, turn knowledge, uh, develop knowledge, and turn knowledge into uh, action. Uh, as a business school, we very much take the view that, hey, what's our business? We're supposed to develop new knowledge, and then we have to translate that and, and communicate that knowledge uh, so that it's of value to business firms and helps business firms uh, to become more effective and more efficient. That's our mission. If we fail in that mission, we don't deserve to exist. You, know, you don't need a business school if it's not going, if all it's going to do is think about weird ideas and never takes these ideas and translates them into uh, action that will be of value to the business community. So we're committed to that. That doesn't mean we don't have lots of weird ideas, but uh, we do try to, um, at, at whether in the short run or in the long run, turn these ideas into uh, meaningful programs that be, uh, will be of value to uh, business firms. So thank you um, for the opportunity, Eric, just to say a few words, and I hope it's a great conference. Um, and uh, I turn it back to you, okay? or to Thank you so much. All right. So with that, we'd like to start our program. And to do so, I'm going to ask John Howard of Applied Predictive Technologies to join me here on the podium and bring your panel on up. Our first panel will be on field experiments. So welcome. Good morning. So you all know you have to pay attention because you owe us questions. That starts immediately. Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. Maybe a familiar quote to all of you from John Wanamaker, who's the first retailer to place a half-page newspaper ad about 140 years ago. Now, as we just talked about and as we'll be talking about throughout the day today, this is still a a challenge, right? It's come a long way, still a lot of difficulty, um, and this morning we'll be talking about the use of field experiments to basically cut through the noise and variation in the real world uh, and understand the impact of the actions that we're taking. Um, you know, really what testing is all about is applying the scientific method. <laughs> and so, to a large degree, I think we all feel like well, how can that be that wrong, right? That feels good, that makes sense. Obviously, the world is in a pure lab environment. We don't go, get to hold everything else constant, and so methodologically, it's quite challenging. 
So we'll be talking today about using consciously designed experiments. It's also possible to use natural variation uh, in data as well. Uh, and uh, we'll be using some case studies to provide lessons that you all can, can take home and apply and implement. This is, by the way, uh, I'm John Howard, Applied Predictive Technologies. What, what we do is provide software capabilities to large-scale organizations to do exactly this, make use of natural variation as well as consciously designed tests to understand what will happen at scale. The kind of main themes in the marketplace today I think we're probably all seeing are one, you have to be accountable for every marketing dollar spent. You don't get money to spend without understanding what the impact will be. And in the world of testing in particular, it's getting easier and easier to test. You know, oftentimes media in the past has been challenging to test. It's difficult, especially in traditional media, to you know, uh, take any given action you want. You're always restricted to, to impacting an entire media market and the like. But those restrictions are actually um, uh, getting simpler over time. They're, they're getting less constraining. And certainly, uh, non-traditional media forms provide all sorts of new capabilities in terms of testing. And we'll hear more about that um, this morning. So the way uh, this is going to work is over the next hour, we're going to have two presentations. Each one is going to go about 20 minutes. Following that, we'll have a panel discussion for about 20 minutes for the balance of the hour. And then we'll open it up for the half hour Q&A following that, that, uh, that hour. So uh, with that said, um, uh, the folks we'll be hearing from, I, I think uh, first Garrett, Randall, and, and David will be uh, sharing their uh, work uh, entitled Add More Ads, Experimentally Measuring Incremental Purchases Due to Increased Frequency of Online Display Advertising. And then Anush Kumar um, uh, will talk about advertising effectiveness of visual bonding and online retail. And we'll be joined on, on the panel following those presentations by Justin Petty, Vice President of Global Media Solutions uh, and Partnerships at Dunhumby. So with that said, Garrett, Randall, David, I think you're first. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, we're very proud of this research. We think it's very exciting, and we hope that you will find it exciting, too. Uh, this is joint work with uh, David Riley and Randall Lewis, who have since moved on to Google. Uh, myself, I am a Northwestern, or was a Northwestern PhD student. I did my defense a week ago, and I'm excited to say I'm going to be joining the University of Rochester in their marketing department at the Simon School of Business come the fall. Uh, so let's talk about our experiment. Uh, the, the thing that we are, the questions that we're trying to answer are three questions. The most basic question is, is retail online display advertising effective at all? And I'm happy to report the answer is yes. Uh, we're able to find that the average effect is 48 cents, plus or minus 40 cents, and that's a confidence interval 19 times out of 20. Now the second question, to go dive a little bit more deeper, we want to answer is, should you add more ads? That is, what is the effect of ad frequency? And we find that returns to advertising are quite constant out to X ad views. Now I'm building in a little bit of suspense here because I want you to think in your own minds what you think X should be, and then when we get to that stage, uh, we'll see what the answer is. Now the final question we want to ask is, which subpopulations are most affected by the advertising? What matters for ad effectiveness? And the answer here is that we find that consumer proximity to the retailer, the recency of the last purchase, their loyalty to the retailer, and consumer income all matter in influencing ad effectiveness. So measuring ad effectiveness is really hard. That's why I have a room full of people who are interested in learning about this, right? Now, it's hard for a lot of reasons. The first thing is data availability. Usually we don't know, we don't have data that says who sees what advertisements. And, and then if we did, 
what they end up spending in a store. Now, the online sector gives us an incredible opportunity to improve on this. However, most ad studies are observational and not experimental. And the problem with observational data is that they can lead us to mistaken conclusions about the effectiveness of advertising. One problem in this is reverse causality. If, we're running in a, if we are trying to test advertising that runs at Christmas time, well, are people spending more because it's Christmas time or are they spending more because of the advertising? Similarly, do firms that spend more on advertising have more sales or do they have more sales and therefore spend more time on advertising? And finally, are the consumers that are seeing your ads different than those that are not seeing your ads? One, I think, neat um, example of this is activity bias. And this comes from our research agenda, principally from my uh, co-authors here. So the graph here uh, shows you something kind of neat. So what we did is we ran an, we ran an experiment where we showed uh, uh, advertising um, on Yahoo. And then we tried to look at a derivative measure, which is searches for that advertiser on Yahoo. Now, this graph shows the number of searches on Yahoo for our advertiser. And where you see that great big spike is at time zero, which is the day that that uh, advertisers, pardon me, the day that the consumers saw the ad. So you would think with that great big spike that ads were really effective, right? They sort of bounce along and all of a sudden they increase by about a thousand percent. Well, but because we have an experiment, we're able to compare the blue line, which is the treatment group, to the red line, which is the control group. And now you see that there's a spike for the control group as well. So why are the control group searches all of a sudden spiking on the day you show the advertising. In fact, it's hard to see there are two lines there. But yeah, in fact, if they're so close together, you can barely see the lines are different. There's actually a 6% increase in the treatment group. But the reason why the control group goes up so much is that even if you condition on all the observables and try and have a look-alike model, the people that are on Yahoo and seeing these ads are more likely to do anything on Yahoo and therefore more likely to search for anything on Yahoo, including that brand ad, that brand name. And so the observational study would tell you that ads are a thousand times effective, but the truth is closer to 6%, which is maybe the thousand sounds better when you talk to your boss, but the, uh, the 6%, <laughs> yeah, the truth hurts. Uh, so the, the key here is that randomized experiments are going to solve these problems. Maybe not your boss problem, but we'll solve the truth problem. And the way they do that is to hold out a baseline group or placebo group that don't see the ads. And this group is going to provide a baseline that answers the question, what would people have purchased if they hadn't seen the ads? So now that I've talked a little bit about um, the value and reasons for experimentation, let me tell you about the experiment we were able to run. Now the reason I'm excited about this is that it's a very large experiment with three million customers. These are joint customers of Yahoo and a major national apparel retailer. The experiment involved an ad campaign that ran for two weeks in spring of 2010, and it includes three experimental treatment groups. The first group is what we call the full treatment group, and they see exclusively the retailer ads. We also have a control group, and what's nice here is that we show them placebo or control ads, and these ads are ads for Yahoo Search, which you see in the bottom left. Finally, we have a third group that is a half treatment group that had an equal chance of seeing um, a mixture of either Yahoo search ads or the retailer ads. And this is going to allow us to say the effect of doubling the expenditure on ads, comparing the half group to the full group. Um, now we were buying millions of ads in this experiment, but the average exposure ended up being 33 retailer ads for the full, excuse me, for the full group and 17 ads for the half group over the course of two weeks. Now that I've introduced our experiment, let me take a step back and talk about experiments in general. This is what I like to call my Clint Eastwood summary of ad experiments. The good is that ad experiments are the gold <laughs> standard. They'll tell you what the true estimate is. The bad, however, as many of you would be quick to point out, is that experiments are costly to implement. Now, the ugly is that even if you run an experiment with a lot of subjects, you may still struggle to detect, pardon me, to detect the effects of advertising. So that, eh, uncomfortable. Let me tell you just why that is. 
And to do so, I want to introduce the concept of statistical power. I don't want to get really technical, but the intuition is that it's hard to detect small effects on noisy outcomes. So the comparison I want to give then is defect detecting the effect of vitamins on heart attacks versus the effects of education on wages. Let's be a little bit more interactive here. Show of hands, who thinks it's going to be easier to detect the effect of vitamins on heart attacks? And who thinks it's going to be harder to detect, or uh, what should I say? Who thinks it's going to be easier to detect the effect of education on wages? Well, I agree. I think it would be easier to detect the effect of education on, re on wages. In fact, I've just spent the last six years of my life doing a PhD, so I'm really counting on there being a large effect. <laughs> Um, so now let's talk about this statistical power in the concept of an ad experiment. So we're trying to test whether ads have any effect at all. So one way of putting that is that we want to test the null hypothesis that delta sales, that is the difference between the sales and the treatment and control groups, is zero. We want to reject that hypothesis. And to have a comparison, we're going to choose an alternative hypothesis of the delta being 51 cents. How we choose that because that corresponds to a 50% profit over the ad spend. The problem though is that the standard deviation on sales in our experiment is $125. However, what's helping us is that even if we look on the people that see ads in the treatment and control groups, we end up with over a half a million people in each group. Usually when marketing people or economists work with um, samples of a million people, we think that we should be able to count the number of angels dancing on a pin. However, in this particular case, it's not quite so optimistic. We're able to show that ads effective, that is, we're able to reject the null at the 10% level, but only 70% of the time. So the first lesson of, of this presentation then is that before you run an experiment, you're going to want to run a statistical power calculation. And the reason for that is, if that power, power calculation tells you that you're only going to be able to detect the effects of advertising 20% of the time, you probably shouldn't be spending all the money on the ad experiment. You're going to be disappointed. So now let's go into our particular experiment and talk about the measurements we were able to get. Now the very baseline measurements were that we found a $400,000 lift due to the retail ads. However, the confidence intervals on that is plus or minus $600,000. And that's sort of like big enough to park Air Force One in, right? So let's see if we can do a little bit better. Now we're going to use the control ads to help us in a couple of ways. Now, we obviously in the treatment group, we're going to have people that see the retailer ads and don't see the retailer ads. Now the nice thing is that by having these placebo ads in the control group, we can also identify the equivalent population in the control group. And then we can just throw out all these users that never see any ads, because of course the effect of seeing no ads should be zero. Now if we throw out that data, we just throw out noise and we get a concentrated effect in the data that's left. And so the payoff from this is that we're able to decrease our confidence intervals by 25%. Now we can go even further by using daily sales data. So not everyone in our experiment sees the ads on the first day of the experiment. We ran the experiment for two weeks and some people say it on the third day or the tenth day. So an additional improvement we can make is to throw out any sales that occur before someone sees the first ad. Because your advertising has to be really good for someone to be affected before they even see the ad. So the nice thing about the control ads is again, we're able to throw out an equivalent, the equivalent data for the control group. So we're not introducing bias by doing this. But we're able to decrease our confidence intervals by 8%. However, the traditional approach to marketing and advertising measurement is just to throw a whole bunch of covariates at the problem. Put a whole bunch of covariates in the model. And we pretty much show the kitchen sink. I won't go through that list. It's on the slides. But we're able to get a 6% decrease in confidence intervals. So 6% is all right. Um, but it's not as good as we're getting from these control ads. And so this leaves us with a preferred estimate of $400,000 plus or minus $400,000, which is a little bit better. It's making, us, um, making it seem that 95% confidence, we're able to say that the ads were effective. And in fact, if we focus just on the full group, that's going to be, we're able to say that with even more confidence. So the second lesson of this presentation is that control ads are often maligned as being these expensive things that just get in the way of ad experiments. 
But I think we're able to show here that control ads actually can provide a whole lot of value. So now let's switch to the second question, which is, uh, what is the effects of ad frequency? And by effects of ad frequency, I mean, what is the increase in sales as we show people more and more advertisements? And this graph here shows on the x-axis the number of ad exposures and on the y-axis the dollars. The green line is the exposed sales, meaning if you're exposed to more and more retail advertisements, the sales keep going up and up and up. However, the costs are this nice flat line. So I think the business um, outcome or the business read of this graph would be, well, let's keep buying more and more ads. This seems to be very profitable. However, if we run an experiment, we're able to look at the blue line. The blue line shows us the control group sales as we have more and more ads exposures. Well, how do we do that? They're not seeing the retailer ads, but they are, however, seeing the placebo ads. So we know as the consumers are seeing more and more placebo ads, their sales are increasing too. Well, how can this be? Obviously, the control ads aren't having an effect on their sales. However, it could be that consumers who are more active online and therefore seeing more ads are more active doing everything, including purchasing more at the stores. And this, this relationship doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but it's something that you'd want to explore. So then we can look at the ad effect, which differences the green line from the blue line, and we see that the ad effect kind of flattens off after a while. So now we see that the business implication is very different, that we should be capping our ads at a certain point. So now you have to look in the mirror and ask yourself the hard question, which analysts, analysts and uh, pardon me, which analysis have I seen in the past when people have tried to tell me where I should put my frequency cap? So the lesson here, the third lesson then, is that we need a baseline provided by the control group to properly evaluate the effects of ad frequency. So now we are arrived at the, oh, pardon me, now we haven't quite arrived at the last question. We're going to actually talk about our results because people seem to care about results for whatever reason. Um, so the question then can be asked as, where is the wear out? At what point do we see decreasing returns to ad frequency? Now I want you to close your eyes and think to yourself, what do you think that number should be over the course of two weeks? I don't see many people closing their eyes, but we'll see <laughs> if I can uh, open them a little bit more with our answer. So our answer is 50, or 50-ish. You now, 50-ish 50, 50 is a true scientific number. Um, <laughs> just ask my parents. If you ask them their age, uh, that's, the, that's the number they'll give. Um, but 50 ads encompasses about 80% of our sample. And within people that, see, or, uh, that are eligible to see up to 50 ads, we see pretty constant or linear returns to ad frequency, which I think many people would find surprising. And within that, we're able to say that uh, the average value of an ad is about eight cents. Now, as for people that see more than 50 ads, this is quite noisy, and so we're not really able to see any effect. However, again, as fair warning, all this is quite noisy, so 50 is an approximate cutoff. Now, I have arrived at the last question, which is which sub pockets of our sample demonstrate the greatest ad effectiveness? Now, I want to take you through how to read this table. The first column is uh, consumer proximity to the, to the nearest retailer. And the cutoff we put on there is whether or not someone lives within a mile of the nearest store. And you see, if someone lives within a mile of the store, the experimental ad effect is $2.88. However, if you live further than a mile from the store, the effect is 49 cents. Now, the final line shows the percentage that satisfy that, that condition. So 3% of people live within a mile of the store. However, within those 3%, we're getting about 20% of the ad effect. So needless to say, this is where the dollars and where the profit is. Now moving to the second column, we also looked at the importance of the recency of a consumer's transaction. And here we set the cutoff as whether or not a consumer transacted within the past eight weeks. Again, we see a large effect. People who transacted recently, uh, the ad effect is $1.62. However, people that uh, transacted less recently, it's 13 cents. Similarly, if we look at uh, consumer loyalty, people that spend over $1,000 in the past two years at the, con at the retailer, the effect is quite a bit larger than those that have not. And finally, wealthier consumers that earn over $100,000 also demonstrate an effect that's about eight times those that don't. 
So this is a little bit surprising. Um, consumer, or retailers try to put their locations where their customers are. And you might think that, um, that uh, retailers already have their best customers and that ads can't, produ can't produce an effect among those, those best customers. After all, they are putting tons of money into the store already. However, what we seem to be s seeing in this particular experiment is that a firm's best consumers are in fact still the ones that the, that the firm can affect the most um, with their advertising, which I think is interesting. Now the final lesson then, of course, is that better targeting obviously can improve the, prob the profitability rather of campaigns. So let me conclude by recapping the lessons I think that we've learned from an industry perspective from our experiment. The first lesson is that you want to do a statistical power calculation before you run an experiment because if you're only going to find an effect 10% of the time, then you're wasting your money and you're going to be really unhappy if you find a negative effect. Uh, the second lesson is that Though control ads are really maligned as just being expensive, they can actually provide tremendous value in giving you confidence in your ad effectiveness measurements. The third lesson is that in terms of ad frequency, it really helps to have a baseline provided by control ads to evaluate the value of an additional ad, imp ad impression. And finally, the last lesson, which is pretty obvious, I suppose, is that better targeting can improve profitability, of course, um, by running an experiment, you're actually going to find out where those pockets of people that are most affected by the ads lie. So I thank you and I look forward to your questions during the panel afterwards. Anuj? Good morning to all of you. My name is Anuj Kumar and I come from University of Florida. Today I'm going to talk about uh, measuring advertising effectiveness of product videos in online retailing. So let me throw some numbers to you. If you, as per the Comscore study, which was conducted in April 2012, they found that uh, US internet users watch to the tune of 9.5 billion video ads. And if you look at these video ads, they are coming from a variety of industries. Retailers like Zappos and J. Cruz to automobile manufacturers like Ford or GM or Mercedes to hotel and travel agencies like Travel Travelocity to real estate agents like uh, uh, Coldwell Bankers or Zero.com. So it kind of begs for a question that it is very clear that product videos are coming or becoming very predominant as a method of advertising in online medium. But what is not clear is how effective are they? And then I looked around and uh, see as to what are the studies or the rigorous empirical studies which are already there in the, in the literature. And I find that most of the studies are confined to laboratory experiments or some kind of a content analysis of the website. And there are not many studies on the transactional data. And I can see why this is so because measuring effectiveness on the transactional data is extremely challenging for two reasons. One is the data that you observe in the real life is generated by a lot of things going inside. And the two things which are going inside are firms are very strategic in you know, introducing product videos. They cherry pick their products. So whatever findings that you will get by this naive study would only say about those products and that cannot be generalized to the population of products. And the second thing is, even the timing of introduction of videos are selected or in, in our academic fraternity we call that endogenously determined. And this is something which is, which is a very difficult question. Just to give you an example, think about a fashion apparel of, you know, a retailer. Around the time when, say, some celebrity endorses one of its product, it's most likely to, you know, put all the other advertising campaigns also for that product. And product video being one of them, the product video may be introduced around the time when a celebrity endorses that product. And if you again do a simple naive, you know, uh, comparison of product sales, you will actually pick up the celebrity endorsement affect and attribute it to a product video. So 
I felt that it is very, very important if you really want to disentangle the net effect of product videos to conduct some kind of a randomized experiment. So now I'll go into the randomized ex experiment or the field study that I conducted. So I conducted a field study on a, on a mid-size women's fashion apparel retailer in the US. It has a turnover of around $300 million and it uses all the channels like stores, catalog and its website. For this study particularly I examined uh, their online spring collection sales which occurred between January 2012 to July 2012. And during this spring collection sales the firm offered something like 571 products in five categories and the categories being tops, dresses, bottoms, accessories and footwear. Just to give you a brief idea of you know product website, uh, the firm's website, uh, the products are displayed category wise on the firm's website. So each category has uh, you know a number of web pages where the thumbnail pictures of the products are put up. And when a customer goes and clicks on one of those thumbnail pictures, it takes her to the product page. And let me give you as to what the product page is. So this is a product page of a top. So top is a focal product here. But in the enlarged picture, you will find that the model is wearing the top along with the complementary products and accessories like the pants, the sandals, and the bracelets. The sandal is not visible, my bad. So these pants, sandals, and bracelets are called uh, coordinating products in this industry. And they are kind of, you know, completing the look of the focal product. So it is important to notice here that there's some kind of a bundling or a visual bundling which is already in place in a static picture. Now what the firm does is, firm introduces a product video or video icon which a customer can go and click on it and what will happen is a customer will be able to see around 18 to 20 seconds high definition video in which the model will walk around and show not only the focal product but also the coordinating products. So in this study, I'm trying to understand what is the net effect of this product video advertising, both on the sales of the focal product, that is in this case a top, as well as the complementary products or the coordinating products, that is the pants, sandals, and the bracelet in this case. Now let me take you to the experimental setup. So now in the experimental setup, uh, think about you have 28 weeks periods from January 2012 to July 2012. And the firm is offering 571 products. So first what we did was we randomly introduced product videos or selected, randomly selected something like 66 products for creation of product videos. So these are the treatment products and then we have the remaining products which are the control products for which no product videos were created. Now we initially let the sales go on as it is for around a one, one and a half month period. And then we introduce product videos. So that is what we call as product switch on, video switch on period. So we introduce the product video for some products and then let it go on for another two and two and a half month. And then we remove the product video and that is what is called the product video switch off period. And what we did was we also created variation in the timing of video introduction. So what we did was we introduced the product videos in three phases and we removed the product videos for these products in three phases. So by three phases I mean say for 20 products I introduced the product video say in mid of February. For another 25 products I introduced the product video in the mid of March. For another remaining you know 20 odd products I introduced the product video in the mid of April. And likewise, I removed it also in the phases. So now there are three things in this experiment which kind of, you know, we feel that it's pretty neat to do. One thing is I address the problem that the products are selected randomly for the introduction of product videos. So the treatment is randomly given to, to, uh, to the population of products. Second, I also made sure that the timing of product video is also randomly chosen and I created a variation in that. So it kind of, you know, obviates any possibility of me being picking up something unobserved time specific for a product. And the third thing is that I also did the switch on effect and then the switch off effect. That is, if there is an effect which is 
getting up because of the product video switch on. And if the product dissipates when I switch off the video, it gives me more assurance that whatever effect that I'm seeing is because of the product video only. Rest is the difference in difference design that I utilize. So pretty much like uh, the difference in difference design works like this, that what I do is for the treatment product, I take the difference in their weekly, average weekly sales with product video minus without <laughs> pre-video period. I also take the difference of control products, average weekly sales in the switch on period minus in the pre-video period. And then I take the difference of the, these two differences, which kind of identifies the net effect of product video. So that is uh, pretty standard in the literature. Now, I use this experimental setup to conduct two analysis. One is the focal product analysis and the other is the coordinating product analysis. In the focal product analysis, I compare the weekly sales of focal products with videos with that of the weekly sales of focal products without videos. And the coordinating product analysis, what I did was I compared the weekly sales of the coordinating products for which the associated focal products video has been introduced with that of coordinating products for which the associated focal products videos are not been introduced. So the first analysis tells me or gives me the net effect of focal product video on the focal product sales. And the second analysis gives me the net impact of focal product video on the coordinating product sales. And needless to say that I control for all other factors which I am observing in the data for which could affect the product sales like all price and non-price promotions and non-price promotions namely being, <coughs> you know, the preferential uh, placement of uh, products on the firm's web page like home, home page or category main page or, you know, the email promotions for the products or, you know, preferential placement of uh, products in the catalog. And it is also, uh, you know, important to see here that in this experimental setup, it is a little different from the treatment and control product in a sense because I have introduced the treatment in three phases. So think about any week, say, for example, a 20th week. So I have some products which are slate, which, which have been, where the product video has been switched on. But there's other products for which the product video has not been switched on, but they have been identified for being put on the product video. So as a result, my control product for any week is not only the typical control uh, products that I have for which no product video has been introduced, as well as the treatment product for which the product video has not been introduced till that period. So again, this makes the finding more robust. All right, so here are the results. In terms of results, I find that the introduction of focal product lead video leads to 15% increase in focal product sales and 31% increase in coordinating product sales. So the interesting finding here is that there is a substantial spillover effects of focal product videos on the coordinating product sales or to put it more in perspective, when I introduce the product video of a top, I find substantial increase in the sales of a matching sandal or a matching bracelet. So then in the same experimental setup, I tried and look at, I tried to look at, but does this product video effect vary with the popularity of the bundled products? So here's the basic intuition. If I, if I bundle, an unpopular product with a popular product, then unpopular product is likely to get some benefit or a sales high because of its bundling with a popular product. But at the same time, this bundling of unpopular product may hurt the sales of the popular product. And that's something which is very, very uh, important for a manager to understand when they are deciding as to what products to bundle. So here's what uh, I did in this. So think about it like, I have something like 300 odd focal products in my, uh, in my experiment. So what I did was I looked at these focal products and looked at their average weekly sales prior to the introduction of their focal product uh, through the videos and then divided into, into two categories, the popular focal products and unpopular fo focal products. I also did the same thing for the associated coordinating products for these focal products. 
So for those associated coordinating products, I again divided them into popular coordinating products and unpopular coordinating products. And hence, with these two categories of focal products and coordinating products, what I did was I created four split samples. So, so for example, the first sample up here is say something like 70 odd uh, focal products which are popular and which are bundled with unpopular coordinating products. Out of these 70 products, for some of them randomly a video has been switched on and then thereafter it has been switched off. So now I'm going to conduct the same experimental analysis on these four different combinations of focal product and coordinating products. Same experiment. But what it allows me to do now is, it's able to tell me that if I introduce the product video for a focal product which is popular, when it is bundled with an unpopular coordinating product, then what is the effect of video? And likewise, I can also do for the second, third, and fourth quadrant of this. In terms of results, I find interesting results. First, I find that the Product videos do not hurt the sale of popular products when they are bundled with unpopular products. And this kind of, this effect is symmetric whether I am taking a popular coordinating product or I am taking a popular focal products. But then I find an asymmetric effect on the sales of unpopular products when they are bundled with a popular product. For example, showing an unpopular coordinating product or showing an unpopular accessory bundled with a popular focal product lift the sales of this accessory. And this is a very relevant findings because uh, when I was sharing this with the industry for which, I mean, uh, the firm for which I did this uh, experiment, for this firm, they had to give massive marks downs to their jewelry that they were the accessories towards the end of their spring collection sale to clear the inventory. So these were very unpopular coordinating products, and I find that if somehow if they can be bundled, you know, strategically with some popular focal products, it has the potential to lift the sales. And in my find, in, in my research, I find that it can lift the sale up to 16%. But surprisingly, I find that showing an unpopular focal product with a popular coordinating product doesn't lift the sales of popular uh, unpopular focal product. So again. Uh, to give you an example, if I'm trying to take or increase the sales of a top, which has not been liked by a majority of people, and if I try and, you know, bundle it with some kind of a, uh, you know, bangles or bracelet, which are very popular, the bangles or bracelets are not able to lift the sales of the focal product. So I, these were my findings, and I look forward to your questions towards them. Oh, I did very fast. Thank you.